Success is when, when our reality catches up to our imagination, which I thought was really interesting because, of course, I've been playing football since I was four and a half, five years old, literally almost 20 years now, you know, which is crazy because when you kind of go backwards in the season, it kind of blows you away. Every couple of years, I look back and yeah, I mean, I dreamed about being a professional athlete. Okay. Welcome back or welcome to the Yogi Ross Show. Uh, we've been experiencing and exploring the mindset of quarterbacks for a long time, high performers, and there's not anybody that has come to this podcast and this show with the background and the story of today's guest, KJ Costello. Uh, we got the draft coming up. You might be listening to this pre-draft, post-draft, who knows when, uh, but KJ, thanks for coming on, man. It's been a while since we've talked. Uh, in person we're doing it in person via zoom and i appreciate you making the time absolutely yogi always a pleasure always a pleasure so w- what is life like now for you here we are just to set the stage it's april 14th and the draft is at the end of the month yeah um it's been it's been interesting obviously being a covered year a lot of training um a lot of reading a lot of studying defenses a little bit of playing golf um, you know, and I've been able to spend some good time with a lot of the NFL guys that have been around veterans, um, mostly within rep one's agency. It's a pretty cool family type atmosphere. A lot of guys want to come to Southern California to hang out and train, um, a couple of former Stanford teammates and JJ and Bobby Okariki, um, and then their roommates, extended friends. So it's kind of a big hangout of, you know, six to 10 of us that kind of are working out together during the day throwing in the evenings, kind of just making stuff work. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool little environment. I love it. All right. So we got a lot of cool stuff to talk about. Uh, The first thing I want to ask you about is something that I had in my notes back in 2015. Uh, For those that don't know, you and I connected that summer at the Elite 11. I'd heard about your name here in Southern California. Uh, And in the Elite 11, we send out documents for quarterbacks to basically fill out, right? Essays, questionnaires, and then we do our own. And we, we like to go pretty hardcore. We may not be as hardcore, KJ, as some of the people in the league right now that you're around. Um, but at least at the high school level, we're hardcore when we began our relationship. And yeah. I thought uh, there was something really cool that that stood out to me. And I want to kind of pick your brain on it. You said when I interviewed you uh, that your dad inspired you to be a man of character and integrity on and off the field. And I'm curious, as a dad, um, how did he do it? Oh, I like that question. Um, Man, thinking back, you know, I mean, obviously I've had a lot of different friends. I've grown up with a lot of different people and you kind of realize that, you know, everybody's got their own way of going about things. And then as you hang around their dads, you kind of realize, you know, the apple really doesn't fall too far from the tree. So when I kind of think about it with my dad, I mean, for him, he was, he was definitely a leader by example. Um, you know, he was, he was like a man of principle, you know, there wasn't like discipline and and doing the right things at the right time. Um, came really easy for him. Well, I don't want to say came easy for him. It was a standard. Like, I mean, he was up at 5.00 AM. Um, and he'd be like working through 11, 12 at night. He always had an office at his house and, you know, I would go to other friends' houses. I go other places and like, we would kind of give him a hard time joking around with him on occasion when we started to understand the whole deal, you know, when we were coming upon first, second, third grade, he was just traditional copier salesman that ended up starting his own company. But he always talked about like when he came home, he'd hung out from like five to eight and then eight to 12, he was prepping for the next day. So when he was up at five 30, he was like already hitting it running by like eight o'clock. Um, and so in terms of, you know, him raising me, like, number one, leading by, like, a lot of people talk about work ethic. I think I was extremely blessed, fortunate to see it. Um, I think, you know, um, everyone has different definitions. Um, It's kind of hard to articulate. I mean, what really is work ethic, you know? Um, First thing that comes to mind is just kind of what I've I've seen um, growing up. Um, and then, you know, it's just like certain little things. I mean, um, like he's talking about character, integrity, honesty falls right in line with that authenticity. Um, you know, a lot of people beating around the bush with their parents saying that, you know, they're going here, they're going there. 
he was always somebody that just was able to like come down to my level and like almost as like a fr- like, like like a friend um best friend my age but then also flip the switch like when i would test the limits with him you know being a friend like you know and and turning into that father figure um so i think just the dichotomy of him kind of being best friend to dad um being best friend to like man of 40 year of experience sharing that wisdom you know me thinking that you know a lot of us nowadays it's funny this new term we stumbled across is like artificial maturity us young kids we think we know everything because we read about it you know we 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 look it up on google or we hear about these things or how how things go in an article or two and all of a sudden like we think we have the wisdom of how to do it um that was one thing that like he proved to me at a very young age that like I had, I didn't have wisdom, you know? So I was like, I learned how to listen well, because I knew I was going to, there was going to be something on the other side that came out good. Um, and just honestly, like, I mean, everybody knows like what they're going to get with him, you know? And like, and, and I kind of just saw that, you know, like, yeah, uh, there's, there's no two, three different people, depending on the atmosphere, in home, out of home, with friends, without friends, coach, you know, he was my coach all growing up and it was awesome. I mean, he would get in my, he would get in my ass, um, often. And like, a lot of times we had this relationship where like, he knew I played better when like, I got a little bit heated. Like that's where my competitive nature came out. So he would kind of, you know, try to organically get me going, you know, whether it was like just doing, doing fun stuff. But, um, I guess it's a long winded answer, you know, kind of saying, um, number one, he led by example. Um, number two is just like always about being the same guy, you know, like he knows what he's going to get when I'm waking up every morning and, and I know what, what I'm going to get with him. Um, and so I'd say like, you know, I'd say that's, you know, be, it was funny. I saw a tweet the other day, something of uh modern day definition of integrity was, um, being the same person, you know, behind closed doors as you are, um, you know, in the public space or, or on a stage, like being able to, to be the exact same person, which, and nowadays in the virtual world with everybody propping up, you know, who they might be versus that, like, thank God, you know, he had no social media. He doesn't know what Twitter is, Instagram, none of that. You know, he's, he's the same guy all the time. Um, and I think that's kind of the root of, um, you know, where, I kind of formulated my definition of character and integrity. That's cool. What, what did he do? Like, what was his profession? Uh, so he was a small business owner. Um, he, uh, you know, was a copier salesman forever. Um, you know, he, he tells the story often, but, you know, was, was living on his buddy's couch and, and stumbled into the industry and then just ended up figuring out this formula, what well, was taught the formula of 100 calls a day you know, hundred calls a day and, and, and eventually the percentages will work out to keep things afloat. Um, and so a hundred calls a day, hundred phone calls a day. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand how difficult that is. Um, and, and so he would prep those hundred, you know, the night before, like the order, the exact order, when, how, what are you going to say? Cliff notes. And so that was just kind of, um, how he started. And then he ended up taking the risk going off, doing his own thing um and still running a very small shop and um you know loves every second of it that's cool man 100 calls a day uh i go back to the elite 11 you know experience that you and i had i gotta imagine you had hundreds of calls coming in to recruit you 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 chose stanford uh i I feel like uh, at least on my notes you committed on march 26th so i'd imagine that was 20 15, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is kind of early in the process. Um, looking back on it now, you know, you've been at two colleges, you know, you finished your career at Mississippi state. Uh, what was that like? How did you handle it? And, and are you happy with, with where you began your career? Yeah. Well, just starting with that, I mean, like I was extraordinarily fulfilled with my experience at Stanford um, I'd say that was an understatement in general. I mean, football aside, everything like 
all all in. It was um, it changed my life for sure. It changed who I was. Um, just starting with Stanford. I mean, I know it's a uh, you kind of going back to the decision, but basically you go to Stanford as a top college athlete. Uh, football player and the honest truth is you're walking into an ecosystem where nobody cares at all what you do let alone you know more often than not they're going to ask you um you know like why you're wearing a sweatsuit or like are, are you working for a startup already like you work for google like they they like dead serious like majority of people have no interest in you know not majority majority of students are not necessarily prioritizing ball so just kind of starting with that like instant uh instantly you kind of dehumanize yourself like you bring yourself back down to earth like McCaffrey's walking around Katie Ledecky's walking around Simone's walking around like Olympic swimmers to like I remember a funny story of like freshman (laughs) um freshman orientation there was a scavenger hunt and like Katie Ledecky tells a story where like some freshman came up to her and was like hey like are you by any chance a student here like we have to get a photo with a student uh, you know, an, an active student at Stanford. <laughs> and she was like, does an Olympic gold medalist count? <laughs> and, uh, and so it was like, just funny stuff like that. So the atmosphere there was incredibly, um, was, was, it, it, it made me grow in so many different ways. Number one, like school classmates, professors, being around that atmosphere, you're a product of your, expi- uh, you're a product of your environment. And I ended up, you know, walking into multiple rooms where like, I was, uh, you know, pretty impressed and stunned by like the preparation and like these guys bought into school as much as like, you know, we, I bought into ball and it was like apparent, it was obvious. Um, So that was Stanford in a nutshell. And then going back to like recruitment process, um, you know, obviously like if I was going back, I'm thinking when I was 16 years old, um, you know, I, I got my first offer from Florida State. They had just won the national title the year before, I think, in 15. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, not in 15. I was, if I was 13 or whatever, 12, because I was a sophomore. And, and then it was like, uh, it was Miami and then it was Tennessee. And then I kind of like, after sophomore year, I ended up going on a trip, which I really appreciated um, going to the South. Um, going to, uh, I went from, I went to Alabama, I went to Tennessee, um, I went to Michigan, I went to Notre Dame. Um, we went a couple of other places that I'm forgetting, but it was a really cool experience. I went with my dad. Um, I went with, I know you remember Dylan Crawford. Um, we were playing the same seven on team, same class. We went with his dad and then we took our trainer at the time who like we all worked out together with. It was a really cool road trip got to sit in the big house when I left the big house I'm like dad I want to go to Michigan he's like okay <laughs> like we can't make an emotional decision it's springtime just wait till you come back here in the summer son you know and I'm sitting there like you know I'm not even found. I'm sitting in the big house like I've seen the famous games and it's springtime coach Nussmeyer knew the perfect time to bring me out there <laughs> and uh you know hey we're not gonna make any emotional decisions we're gonna see all this go back I saw Alabama oh my god like they offered 10 guys like we got dad we got to hurry and, and commit because it's Alabama it's first come first serve like no we're gonna wait we're not gonna make any knee-jerk you know emotional decisions fast forward like Michigan or, or sorry Tennessee all these places were awesome but then it was like you know I was a California kid I loved USC I was a huge Pete Carroll fan um, you know, I mean, I still, I seriously still have liner Pete Carroll or sorry, liner Reggie Bush, Lendell white jerseys in my closet. Um, and my mom, my mom went there for two years and then ended up finishing up at San Diego state, uh, graduated with my dad. Um, but I was just like a huge Carson Palmer fan, went to my high school. So then like those offers happened first. And so I went on the trip and then I didn't, I didn't get, uh, USC, Stanford well I guess I got a a Stanford offer and then the next day I got USC and then it was like Pac-12 and it was funny the first place I ever visited was was Stanford first place I ever went as a freshman just to camp you know flew up there I went to a camp and it was funny because they were recruiting Max Turk you know who ended up going to USC a bunch of alignment on my high school and long story short I ended up going to Stanford I loved it um 
And then it basically came down to Stanford, USC, and Michigan. And um, at the time, right when I was thinking about committing, Sarkeesian uh, left USC. Um, and I figured the most stable decision and like really being a SoCal kid, like I, SC was awesome. You know, it was like between SC and Stanford. And I thought it'd be super interesting to go to Northern California, you know, you hear about the Silicon Valley, but like none of us go up there unless we have to. And none of them come down here really, unless they have to, at least being a young kid. And so um, I figured, you know, school was important to me. Uh, I was really impressed with their, their installation system, like how they would install plays. Like they went through multiple installations to like um, uh, sophomores and juniors in high school to like teach you about their stuff. They had that really wired down well to kind of um, give you a little glimpse of what it was going to be like and put my future in their hands. And it was awesome. I mean, coach Pritchard was amazing. Shaw, like all those guys, it was just like um, I was blessed, you know, to be able to watch McCaffrey. He, you know, they put my freshman locker right next to his. I watched everything he did, basically took notes of everything he he, he did. And he, he was so funny. I always said, like, everyone act like success was like this, um, like, imaginary thing that, like, nobody knows what it is. He's like, it, it, it really comes it's, – it's a copycat league at the end of the day. Like, the blueprints writ, written in terms of work ethic and whatnot, and he would just – day in and day out. He was like, I never seen anybody like work as well as Sam and everything was just um, blew me away. So that was a good, good uh, mentor of mine at the time. And then, you know, fast forward through the seat, like my whole time there, I mean, my best friends, you know, five or six roommates, we all lived together Four being football players, two being wrestlers, um, you know, like had an incredible experience. Yeah, I, I can remember your first camp. We've had this conversation before where we talked <laughs> after practice. I remember this. <laughs> and you're like, I think it was week one. I just doing my training camp tour and you're like, I think I'm going to go win this job. You know, I'm going to get this. And I was like, awesome. And then I think it was, you know, months later it was the season and it was like, yeah, the system was a little harder than, than maybe it was yeah. day, day one, day two install. But you ended up oh, winning the fun. job. And I got to call a lot of your games, man. And, uh, and I, man, I had such a joy. And one of my favorite parts of going to campus would be Friday meetings. And for those that don't know, broadcasters meet with coaches and players on Fridays. And I would meet with Coach Shaw, obviously, in preparation for the game. And I ask him this still to this day on every Friday meeting is, hey, tell me something about what Bill Walsh taught you about the quarterback position. And he's got this journal, journals in his desk um, where he would take notes when those two would meet. And he always came down to anticipation and the word discernment. And two mm. things that uh, you are clearly well versed at. When when you look back at the position and you think of the word discernment, what what story, what thoughts come to mind? Wow, that's awesome! Yes, it's cool that you're letting me know that now because it was a huge point of emphasis for me. Uh, I'm sure Shaw and and Pritchard Pritchard was coached um, by Shaw and, and Harbaugh and them. So that was a big emphasis for me at my freshman year coming in, like learning and understanding like what the word itself meant in their system. You know, <laughs> Coach Frisch always used to say it's a well-oiled machine, but like it's it's decisive, um, consistent decision making. And like there you have it, discernment, like con uh, uh, decisive decision making that, um, you know, it ultimately a lot of people sometimes will tag it as like, they, they, they say game manager, they say all these different things like discernment in terms of the Bill Walsh, the Stanford, the pro style West coast um, come to the line of scrimmage with three plays and come to the line of scrimmage with three plays, uh, uh, two runs, kill to a pass. Um, we're we're going to send a motion and try and set the front. You know, I know you know this, but the people listening 25 front versus 34 or 57, like, depending on the shades of, of the D linemen, like we were going to run a play that gave us leverage via combo blocks through the, through um, the defensive front to the linebackers. And then if they ended up wanting to bring a safety down um, into the box or we didn't like the leverage or, or Z or X couldn't dig them out, um, we would end up getting out of the play and moving to the third play. And so there was discernment in terms of like understanding 
what exactly we were trying to do, when we were trying to do it. And then there was discernment in play. Like, um, you know, Coach Shaw, like, it's amazing. Like, when you kind of watch his coaching style over the years, he wins so many games. You could you could tag that to just the simple thing of discernment. Like, everybody gets giddy on game day. Everybody gets a little trigger happy. Everybody gets a little overconfident. Um, everybody thinks they see a little more than, than they really do. And like a lot of his decisions in terms of like is, is like a, a calculation over time of like his best bet. I mean, you watched a lot of those games. He ended up winning a lot of games by at the end of the getting up a touchdown or two or 10 points, like the way he would control the end of the game and basically stifle the other, the opponent's ability to win the game was super impressive. I mean, I remember playing, um, especially with Bryce, when we had a good running game for that two-year span. Like, you'd have the, the game plan pre. They do so much preparation. It's, it's absurd. Uh, Bloomgren would know blitzes they were gonna, that, that they ran literally 15 years ago. Like, <laughs> Pendergast somewhere else 15 years ago against USC. It's like, here comes the chubby dog. You know, and we would prepare for every single one of them, which was crazy. But um, you had the game plan. You knew what everybody in the building was trying to do. And I've played in other systems. You know, I've been elsewhere. And, and I, I don't want to speak for everywhere else in college football. But most coaching staffs aren't trying to do exactly that in a college football game. They do some other things better than we do, you know. But in terms of Stanford, they're going to come prepared exactly what they wanted to do. And so the discernment piece was like, like, when are we going to try and take a shot? You know, like, on, like, like, how are we going to maximize our ability to protect the football, mitigate turnovers, mitigate momentum changes? You know, um, it was just, it was a style of play that I think obviously back in the day won tons of games and still does, but it's becoming more foreign. You know, now everyone says it's boring. It looks super simple. You know, and, and it was so funny listening to people say that because it's like 10 times harder than a lot of these other systems. But how it looks on the outside is a lot different. Costello looking for the end zone. There it is. That typical Stanford play. You know it's coming. You can't stop it. Our Sega White side wins the jump ball. So, I mean, when it boils down to discernment and anticipation, I mean, it's like, when do you move on? When, when are you willing to make a risky throw? When are you willing to make a big throw? When do we just need a completion? When it comes to anticipation, it's like a lot of the preparations done on, on the uh, um, ID coverage front. We know the four to five coverages they can play. And most of the time they're matching it to a front that these guys were picking. And so most of the time you knew based on the front where the safety was rotating, you can anticipate the coverage. Therefore you can anticipate who you were, who you, who you were, uh, high lowing or who you were um, stressing and you can pull the trigger a quarter of a 0.2 seconds faster. And that's where I, you know, that's when we really, I, I really started having success personally. It was like, Holy smokes. I thought he was going to the flat. He just went and like, it's already out. Um, so that like a lot of that credit is to them. I say like the discernment pieces is, is more decision-making and then anticipation would be the side of playing ahead of the game. Um, and then the prepper, uh, you know, attaching your feet to your eyes. Like a lot of people think it's old school, but like, um, you don't miss when it's there, um, with their, with that style of play. So, um, it was, de- I was definitely really fortunate to be in their system. Yeah. I'm going to circle back on that in a second, but, um, you go to at least on paper, <laughs> what might seem, uh, relative antithesis of Stanford's offense. You go play for Mike Leach. Right. And Coach Leach is a good friend of mine. Um, yeah. I've, I've been around him a ton, as you know. Uh, you saw that offense up close as a competitor in the Pac-12 North. Right? I know quarterbacks always watch quarterbacks, per se, you know, yeah. when they have time yeah. on the opposite sideline. And then you went and played in it. Castello throws, lost one complete. On the run is Mitchell. Mitchell down the sideline. Touchdown, Bulldogs. Osiris Mitchell from Costello. Perfect throw. Perfect touch. What was the what was the, the thing that really uh surprised you playing 
quarterback in the air raid. I'm sure you felt as though you were knowing you, you probably felt as prepared as anything, you know, just knowing yeah. your personality, but w- w- was there something around yeah. playing the position there? So, um, I actually had a really interesting experience post draft, um, talking to like, um, some former NFL coaches, some coaches going way back to like the wishbone and like, it kind of all came together. Like, like the wishbone, um, O-line coaches formulating West coast pro style. And then you have like the, uh, uh, how mummy and in leech and like that lineage that basically, They didn't want to get complicated with formations, with motions, with getting in multiple plays. They didn't want a, you know, typical two by two set. They wanted nobody moving around, you know, like, so basically I preface with that by saying playing both is kind of insane. Like if you study the football (laughs) history, like ultimately they're trying to, they can produce the same outcome when it comes to the passing game. Obviously, one is extremely more well versed in the running game than the other, but the same the same reason why the run game is better in the pro style, the Michigans, the the you know the Patriots, that you know you name it, um, is what it could be the reason why the passing game isn't as good. So like the old lineage of like we want a Y, we want a Z, we want an X, we want an F, and we want a, uh, an H halfback. We don't want a moving. Because if we're going to do the math problem of how many times we're going to run 95, you know, go 10 yard out, Y cross, post dig, back swinging, your basic read, everybody in the country had that play in high school. But if you're now building, building in reactions, like, you know, I got a funny, <laughs> it, it was crazy going from the two, you know, like um, Coach Leach, uh, we had a great time. We learned a ton from each other and kind of went back and forth. But Basically, in a nutshell, the, the difference between the two is they're ultimately trying to produce the same sort of outcome in the end. One being the air raid is like training, like an intuitive response, like intuition through thousands and thousands and thousands of reps. You can feel it in practice. You can feel it in the structure of everything you do. And the other one is, is much more um, – uh, front end, front loaded, like articulated, exact depths, exactly where you're doing, exact steps. Like you don't take three and two hitches to that curl. You take three, one hitch. Now you're to the, you take three, no hitches to the flat. If you're going to beat it out there now, three, one hitch to the curl. You take your second hitch to the tight end over the ball, the third hitch to your, your back on a swing or a four by two to the left. Coach Leach, we didn't really tie drops to anything. It was a feel thing. It was a dance step. It was like, you know, maybe on occasion you want to start with the Y because like you wanted to start with the Y, you know, and then over time, I mean, talking to um, obviously had a bunch of guys there and Anthony Gordon, I talked to him a little bit. It's like these guys get to the same outcome. I mean, Anthony Gordon led the Pac-12 in, 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 you know, passing yards. So one's not better than the other. There's no, you know, it's like chicken or the egg at that point, but it, but it was interesting being on the front end. Like it was interesting being on the front end of an air raid being um, installed because like it was, I didn't want to think too deep. It was COVID, everything was going on, but being in a system like at Washington state where they all know the system, they know the responses and they're teaching me and it's either I learn. Right. Or like, or it's not going to go in a system where it's like I'm learning and I'm teaching and we're all learning together. It was a totally different deal. So I don't want to speak like, you know, I'm pro one or the other. Um, It was just a great experience kind of seeing like, you know, there's two ways to skin a cat and like both have been extremely successful. Um, And the craziest thing is the coaches over here who articulate it this way, West coast pro style, Green right wing tight, Z short, 96 power, kill 95 weak, alert 300 jet dragon versus ace right 95. Like there's a huge like terminology <laughs> barrier between the two. And, you know, most of the time the coach who's in this lineage ain't crossing over into this lineage. And it's, so it's pretty cool to see that like, you know, there's more, 
there, there's so many different ways to play football. Um, and, you know, I was grateful, man, like just for the experience, um, you know, I, I, you know, you, you know, I mean, I've had an incredible journey. It's been so many like peaks and, and some valleys, like it's part of the, it's part of the process, but like just between those two systems, um, it's been pretty cool to kind of understand, um, you know, the history behind it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we could talk about offensive football forever, but I, I won't do yeah. that um, right now. Yeah. But I, I think to put a button on that part of it, it's really unique in my eyes to be you at the position because you played in, I don't even think it's an argument, probably the most respected offense in the, in the modern history of football, the West Coast offense. Yeah. And yeah. you also played a season – in an offense that is probably the most widely run offense in modern yeah. day football. I'm talking high school, high school, yeah, yeah, or college. Yeah. Um, and for me, if I was like going to start a program tomorrow and we didn't have the ability to maybe recruit elite players, I'd probably do what Coach Leach did like, give me a chance, like, give yeah. me a chance to go win, um, or at least move the ball a little bit. So yeah. I, I just think it's, I think it's really cool. And and I remember talking to other guys like you know JT Daniels had had an element of going through that you know pro style yeah. guy that then you know played the air raid a little bit, uh, but but you your brain got trained in both. So as we spin it forward to the next phase of your life, what has it been like, whether it's on Zoom or however you've been doing it, talking to people in the NFL, because you can talk both languages, man. I'd imagine pretty fluently. Yeah, well, ultimately, you know, just my journey and whatnot. I mean, just kind of rewinding back to, back to um, playing in the air raid as well. I mean, I thought it ultimately be a value add in the long run because I have seen the Andy Reeds. I have seen, you know, multiple coaches in the NFL drawing up these air raid type concepts, but it's so funny. Cause like the same concepts really are in the West coast, totally. but it's like, if it's shotgun, you know, if it's shotgun and like, if it's four out and there's no tight ends, it's an air raid concept. You know, like a lot of these other guys get in the same spots, just in a little bit different manner. But ultimately, you know, I it's been interesting to me to study the teams, the systems that, uh, you know, Shanahan, McVay, um, you know, Vikings, um, Denver, pay, well, of course, uh, you know, Coach Belichick, he, he's got that number system. He's basically got to create like a language barrier to what he's doing, which is, which is awesome. I've been trying to learn that as well. Um, but you know, there's probably like a third to two thirds that are running like some tree of that Walsh lineage, you know, in Cleveland, they're doing a little bit of it. I had a whole list of the teams. I am blanking on it now, but there's a good bulk of the teams, um, you know, chargers, what they were doing down there with Herbert, um, obviously the Niners and, so I've kind of been spending more time like in those kind of playbooks. Um, you know, I was fortunate, you know, to be with coach John Beck at, at 3D QB and, you know, he, he's a smart, he's a smart cat. He's really good. Um, he's been in a lot of those systems. Um, you know, he coaches a lot of the guys in those systems. So it's been cool to kind of dive into like, you know, and then I'm missing that number system is, you know, and we don't need to talk about that. We can talk about that later, but, in terms of just like um, it's just a different way of kind of getting to West coast faster. If you're picking a guy up off free agency and whatnot, there's not a huge barrier to entry. Um, So I've been studying all the systems. Um, It's been cool talking to coaches, you know, going through installs. It's like this concept West coast pro style concept. When I ran that at Stanford, it was three jet buster alley. Uh, When I ran that at, uh, Mississippi State, it was 94. It was just, but like, so one other thing I had to say about the area, which is really interesting, Coach Lee's told me this one. We were sitting out there at practice, we could talk about anything. That, that was something that blew my mind. And I said, Coach, like, what was the origin of the air raid? Like, what, like, you know, we won't say the number of plays, but like, you know, like, how, like, how, how'd you lock this in? It's like, you've been doing this for 25 years. And, um, it's like, if you take every concept of football and like you were to run, you know, you were to scrape it and see where everybody end up in every pass play. He basically just created X amount of plays 
tight sheet of plays that fundamentally get some guy in every spot of the field, just like the majority of every, every NFL, every college, every high school play. So, but he just wanted to kind of streamline it to where you'd run that particular play so many times that once again, we know like it, it becomes habit. You, you kind of react before knowing type stuff. And I've, you know, I, I did have, I, I wish, you know, in a way I could have been more versed. Like I definitely would have played as well as Stanford if I played that year in my, the first year in the system. I thought that was the fastest system I could learn and have a chance at success because of this simplicity on the front end. It was rep intensive on the back end. Um, but, you know, like you kind of said, there's multiple ways to play the game. Yeah, I've always felt that uh, a quarterback's job is to gain mastery over the system. Right. So if your system calls you to hand it off 30 times or 40 times, or if your system calls you to throw it 30 or 40 times, like your only job is to gain mastery over it. And then there's the drop down menu, right? In air raid, it'd be green grass, you know, trust your eyes. Uh, Don't be a coverage scientist, as Coach Leach would tell me many times when I'd interview him about the system. Or in the West Coast offense, Right. It would tie your feet to your eyes, right? To you know, understand four minute offense, understand how to set teams up, like you reference with the Bryce Loves of the World. When you have a lead, yeah. run the football, we're gonna just bleed this team out. And, yeah. and that's how we're gonna win the game. So I I just think that's really unique for you. So so within that, you know, you're on the verge of you know something that I think a lot of football players dream of, which is hearing their name called and going to an NFL facility and go to a locker room and seeing your last name. Did you, as a kid, as a college player, or have you not ever had this definition around like, yeah, to me, to make it, it means to go to the league or or, or was it something else? Or have you never had that thought? Um, it was funny. I kind of did a little bit of homework on questions I thought you'd ask. And I stumbled across something I wrote down a while ago and it was like, basically said, Success is when when our reality catches up to our imagination, which I thought was really interesting because, of course, I've been playing football since I was, let's see, uh, four, four and a half, five years old. I'm going on 23 years, uh, going on 24. I'm 23. So I've been playing football for literally almost uh, uh, 20 years now, you know, um, 19 seasons, I think it is you know, counting flag football, which is crazy because when you kind of go backwards in the season, it kind of blows you away. But I always do that every couple, every couple of years I look back and like, yeah, I mean, I, I dream, I dreamed about being a professional athlete. You know, when I was playing baseball, I dreamed about being, you know, before he got caught, I dreamed about being a Barry Bonds, you know, like I dreamed about being, a, you know, Derek Jeter, you know, when, when Kobe was playing, you know, I love Dirk Nowitzki growing up. I thought I had a fadeaway like Dirk, you know, like uh, when I was playing golf, like I thought, you know, I was obsessed with Tiger. And then when I was playing football um, as a kid, like really, I, I seriously, like a lot of people say I'm a bandwagon. I, I clinged on to Brady because I was a, a SoCal kid. I know that doesn't make any sense at the start. Um, the Chargers were playing and they were always on CBS and then LT retired when I was like seven or eight years old. Um, and I love Philip. I've learned so much about Philip recently. And like, I, I idolize, I, I watch a lot more Philip tape than I ever have because I've learned so much more about him, but I started watching um, Brady on CBS because they were playing the Patriots and they were winning all the time. I'm like, who's this young guy? And so like, that's where like my, my memory goes back to, Believe it or not, back in the day, <laughs> I tell people it's crazy, but like I remember um, being, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, playing tackle football, playing and getting all hyped up for a Saturday game, playing linebacker and quarterback. Like I go from quarterback to where they're hitting me to going on the other side, put two two pads on my elbows because I broke my elbow once and playing middle linebacker. And I would wake up on Sunday so sore, like my neck. You know, like, I mean, we got after we, we, we went like five years without losing a game. It was all my best friends still kind of to this day. And I go down on the couch on Sundays and I would just be watching, watching Brady. 
Like, if they weren't playing, I'd find a way. Like, I remember Red Zone came out way back then, and, you know, whether it was YouTube or whatever it was. So, I mean, I I definitely, like, I didn't know it was going to be football, but I knew because, like, when the time came, it was just, like, the camaraderie, the the um, the chemistry of, like, being that guy that everybody looked to to find a way to elevate them. Like, I felt like a lot of people may think, like, um, a, a lot of people want that job. A lot of people don't necessarily know what that job calls for. Uh, personally, the most effective ones, I think, are incredibly unselfish. People don't necessarily understand that most of the time. And so that's kind of what I loved about it. I was always learning. I was always had to be on my toes. Um, and then just, I mean, talking about a dream, like, you know, I, uh, you know, I dream about a lot of things, but, um, you know, playing ball has always been, you know, at the top of that list in the NFL. So it doesn't necessarily seem real, man. Like COVID doing the zoom calls, like what we're doing now, like it's crazy, but it is, it is here. So I'm excited for, um, what it is to come. Yeah. I, I think we're all going to have incredible stories to tell our kids and, and families about what everybody's gone through over the last year and year and some change. I, I think what you said is really cool about imagination. And to me, imagination is one of my favorite words. And wonderment is one of my favorite words. And wonder, one might say, I believe, is tied to imagination. Right? And our imagination is always on. Right? Science would say that. Like, you're imagining yourself throwing three picks or three touchdowns. Right? And worry yeah. being the best, biggest misuse of that imagination. But wonderment, um, and I talk to a lot of quarterbacks now at the Elite 11 about this, is wonderment is amazing. And sometimes I call it your wonder switch can get turned off. It can get turned off. And it often, I believe, can only get turned off by somebody else. So your sense of wonder would be when you go out to the big house, oh, my God, I can imagine myself playing in front of 100 plus thousand. You go to Stanford, I can imagine leading them on the farm or to a Rose Bowl. And then somebody can turn that switch off. It could be the internet, Twitter. It could be a coach not believing in you. It could be a teammate. It could be something in your personal life. It could be a lot of things, but very rarely um, is it you. But you're the only one that has the power to turn it back on. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I'm loving the game again. I'm loving my craft again. I believe making it for me is tapping back in to my imagination and reality meeting that, as, as you eloquently said a few moments ago. I ask you that because... Um, I think our wonder switch can get turned off often. Um, it happens almost on a daily I think, case for a lot of us. If you want to look at the internet, I've looked at the internet a lot in preparation of this. I've seen a lot of your draft profiles. Um, I know you probably as well as any analyst in the country. Has your wonder switch ever been turned off? I'm, I'm sure it has. And yeah. when it has probably more importantly, what are some of the skills that you used to make sure that you turned it back on? I love that question. I actually still have my notepads of um, when when you guys had me down at Elite Eleven uh, just a year ago, and like I highlighted I highlighted that like three times because um, it makes so much sense. Um, obviously, like the wonder switch is directly tied to self esteem, you know. And you you asked me personally if my wonder switch has ever turned off. Absolutely, I'd be lying if I if if if, if it um, if I said it didn't. Um, for extended period of time, typically, typically not. There's been parts of, uh, there's been times in my career when you can say it has, um, maybe for a week, maybe for two, maybe one week on, one week off and back, and you're trying to figure it out. Um, oftentimes, it's never really in season. It's always out of season. You know, um, I feel like you're uh, like in season, like you're um, you're the time between your imagination and, and, and turning that into reality is like, it's much more realistic. It seems to where the motivation, like the, um, the personal encouragement and just like the raw um, loving and joy of like the moment is, is a, it's a lot easier to get yourself into that. Um, at least for me, um the wonder switch man i mean like nowadays you know i talk to teammates i talk to guys in the league 
um, former teammates at Stanford. You know, I have old friends that went elsewhere, college students. It's so funny what you say is because, like, it's crazy because nowadays um, people are afraid to wonder, you know, and, and, and I've never been afraid to wonder. I think um, oftentimes I think a lot of people feel like um, saying what they imagine, right, or, or it, it's, it's uh, they're scared to say it because like the favorite, the greatest thing I learned, one of the greatest pieces of advice I learned to this day was from you guys at Elite 11 with Gervais of um, uh, removing fear of other people's opinions. And it was strictly in the one stint when Gervais talked about, hey, room of the top 11 quarterbacks in the country, we're on ESPN right now, they're shooting behind us. Who's going to stand up and tell me their goals for this year, you know, or aspirations or, or who you are or what your purpose is. And you have 11 guys, top 11 quarterbacks in the country. One of, one of the guys was me sitting there and things were rattling off of my head. I wanted to get up there and I wanted to go, but God, there was just like a force field weighing me down. And, and, and it hit me when he goes, yeah, you guys all have thoughts come to your mind, you know, like, you're you're simply afraid of the judgment of other people's opinions when you say what's personal to you, you know? And so and nowadays, like, it's crazy because I, like, I removed myself from, um, like, the transition from fear to opportunity. It's so subtle, but that's how I turn my wonder switch back on. Mm. Just there. Like, like, when when it starts to become like when self-talk um you know when injury when pain like is is hanging around too long like yeah it was a legit injury you got rest something happened and all of a sudden like the patterns are just they're building you know it's like um whether it was a bad game or you name it bad day like you said coach is questioning you he's on top of you um maybe like on occasion you're young guys in the locker room are questioning whether you're the guy you know, they're like, you've only played one game, um, you know, and, and that's when for me, it's like uh, the wonder switch is bright when I'm like getting myself in the zone of like another thing that, that actually has helped me a ton is in the past, like two years um, learning about like the RAS system. I know it's kind of complex. I'm sure you know about it, but I keep it simple. It's like, your brain could basically see 11 million bits of information per second. And the RAS is the filtration system of the 40 bits of the million, the 11 million you focus on. And ultimately it's deep, intense practice over time, daily, over months, years um, on end um, where I recently, you know, realized in the past year and a half, two years, when the wonder switch is turned off for the longest time it ever has, you know, after reflection, after understanding, like I keep a little bit of a black box of like, oftentimes I find a, another way I turn the switch back on is um, I go back and re oftentimes everybody defines, uh, can easily define their failures, right? It's so easy to be a critic to yourself. Um, it's actually kind of like praised anxiety to like be humble but oftentimes people actually um put themselves in a hole because they'll like you know they'll they'll build up um maybe like negative emotion or like in the story they're telling themselves and that becomes a memory so like i find it more effective to turn the switch back on when i'm defining uh, uh when i'm defining success so like more like if if i feel as if maybe the switch has been turned off. I'm, I'm flipping back in my black box, my book of like all the days in my life that I remember from games to, you know, days with family to times with grandma and grandpa to, you know, anything to when I was like, wow, like I'm just struck by like gratefulness, whatever. Um, post game during the game. Um, it, it, it allows me to, it's, it's kind of along the lines of like, it gets you back in that world of like you're saying you believing in yourself with conviction. Therefore nothing else matters. 
and in the social media era, like the virtual world, like it's just, it's so difficult for a lot of people to do um, because uh, it's not sex. Like, like it's too uh, complex for people to talk about. You, you can't talk about this in a tweet, you know, you can't talk about this and, and hit online, you know? So like, but that's not what it's about. You know, if you're not prioritizing that, that's the way to get out of it. So it's basically just the whole theme of internalizing success and externalizing failure. Like I try and fail as fast as I can, you know, like it's kind of a Silicon Valley thing, which I picked up because the way these guys iterate and they build these companies that change the world is they encourage failure. Like how fast can we fail so we can collect data? And I know it's a little bit more objective in that world. So we can collect data, iterate, brainstorm, build the prototype, move on and, and make it better, you know? Oh, so true. And so, yeah, no, that's no, it. I, I love that. I, I have two thoughts. Uh, one on failing fast. Uh, about five years ago, I'm walking through the streets of Venice with a friend of mine here in SoCal in LA. And we run into one of his buddies and he's like, come to my office. I said, sure. We go into his little office on Abbey Kinney and he shows us his app. And I forget the name of it, but it was basically a way that you can communicate with people in real time. And I always wonder what happened to that app. Never heard of it again. Just kind of died. I was one of the beta users, you know, and then a couple of weeks ago, I'm reading an article and it talks about how this app, which the name uh, was written and it reminded me of what the app was, has become Clubhouse. They failed really fast at whatever the app was called at the time. They reiterated and away they went. And yeah. I thought that was amazing. Uh, and it triggered me in your story because what I was taught years ago by uh, the same guy you referenced, the sports psychologist, Dr. Michael Gervais, he said, uh, Yogi, at the core of optimism is resilience. Hmm. And when I heard that quote, my whole life made sense. At the core of optimism is resilience. And I was often told, um, oh, you're too positive. You're always, yeah. you're always smiling. Do you ever have a yeah. bad day? Is it, you know, I'm sure people are curious if it was BS. And I was always yeah. like, no, nah, it's not BS. I can process that shit real quick. And yeah. what when he said that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I am really resilient. And, and I thought it was yeah. really important because I just needed somebody to shine a light on something I didn't know. And all of yeah. a sudden, life made a ton of sense. And, and as you were talking, that, that's the quote that I thought of around how you can process challenging times wonder switch being off whatever it is and have the control and the wherewithal to no 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 i'm good i'll be fine let's go yeah you know yeah. and i feel like that that's like your phrase like if i had you mic'd up i feel like let's go is like kj <laughs> like something like that in a huddle with yeah. a grass stain on and some eye yeah. block is like is how i just see you man yeah no i appreciate it that's i yeah that's that's definitely it man i i i loved um his pieces on optimism. I read it all the time. Like I, I always saw it as he, he said a couple of years ago, the rudimental toughness is optimism. Totally. Nobody think nobody thinks like that. You know, yeah. nobody mental toughness is like basically beating yourself up, you know, like the old way of mental toughness is like, totally. you know, acting like nothing hurts. And like when it's really bad, acting like it ain't bad and just letting it. So that's, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. I love it. All right. So we're going to get you out of here in a minute, man. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm working on a project right now talking to uh, guys like you when they're 16. You yep. know, the four or five star Mr. Everything quarterback. Here you are on the other end of that. And you've had incredible, mm-hmm. you know, perspective maybe is the word, right? Humility is, is too easy, right? Like you're confident. You know you can play. Uh, you've proven you could play. Uh, but but this era is it has a lot going on, and and I and I'm doing this I'm, I'm doing this project because uh, I've seen for 20 years now the same questions being asked by somebody at that age or the parents of that person at that age, and man like the results aren't necessarily changing, right? It's the same. Like if you've got a good team around you, right? Mom, dad, coach, like you you'll be okay. If your parents are asking you to make it to the league so you can take care of them and their future. Uh, a lot of guys don't, don't survive that. You know, I've, I, I, I have a vivid memory of some quarterbacks uh, that, you know, that have the NFL tattooed on their arm and they had it done at 15. 
So, uh, and, and that, ha- and they're still, and they're not starting in college football and they're probably never going to start in the NFL. So, so with that said, like, what would, what would you say to the young you, or what would you say to a kid right now who, you know, grew up and it was, it was still probably watching Tom Brady on CBS, wake, waking up in the mornings um, and, and was hoping one day that, you know, their imagination meets their, meets their dreams and aspirations. Man, um, I don't want to steal the words out of Coach Dilfer's mouth, but once again, when I was down there at Elite 11, for some reason, I always remember everything you guys say. Um, but he's, he was talking a lot about EQ, emotional intelligence. Um, I wouldn't say just the quarterbacks in this era coming up now are lacking that. Um, I would say, you know, generations – you know, younger and younger growing up in, in, um, you know, this digital age, like they're living, you know, they, I don't know. Most of them probably had Twitter when they were like, um, too young, two second, third, fourth grade. I don't know. Oh, fifth oh, grade. I, I mean, nowadays, you know, they say a generational gap is separated by five years. It used to be my dad, my grandpa and his dad. That's 40 years. Now it's five, like, you gotta, you know, so I think number one, is like emotional intelligence, like what you just said, like, God, like, like tying your identity. Like you asked me, like, Hey, like, did you dream about your name being on, uh, you know, a plaque in an NFL locker room? Sure. I had dreams about it, but I wasn't living my life every day thinking as if whether I made it or I didn't, because like already that in itself, is distracting you from, from being, you know, and that's what I think that generation struggles with. And it's not their fault per se, but, um, you know, the Twitter, Instagram media could essentially have just as much impact or more than their parents. I know that wasn't the case with me, you know, um, growing up and, 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 you know, I know that um, it's just so important. Like you said, perspective, you know, respect, principle, like, like, it's just in a way, like being able to process information and like, like filter, um, filter the majority of the information and like understand where it's coming from, who it's coming from. Like who exactly is writing that you're the best quarterback in the country and you should be starting for the page. You should be the first pick of the draft, you know, like be a little bit more uh, um, intentional, like of like before you allow it to just kind of take you over and then you're living in like an illusion, you know, I mean, like, that's what I think the problem is. is It's like you say, I I, want to say it's not their fault. Right. But like, at the same time, and, and I remember when I was when I was that age, and, and and you guys were telling me, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, well, first of all, I was like, wow, this all this other this stuff's making a ton of sense. But when they start doing the undressing piece, it's really hard um, to go backwards. So I just say I wouldn't say they need to go backwards. I would just say moving forward, like gratitude, humility, man, like for the best guys, for, 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 for the guys who think they're the best for everybody in between. Like that's the only way to um, not miss everything that's going on, you know? And, um, and, and a big thing is, man, like I've had, it's crazy. It's hard for me to even comprehend, but like there was a kid who, who, you know, uh, like, you know, ended up like taking his life who, who I, 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 uh, I trained for like four or five years at uh, Clarkson camp. And, and it was a crazy tragic story. And all nowadays, all you can do is kind of, um, you know, learn from it and kind of, uh, kind of understand like what, why, uh, you know, why exact. And the bottom line is I'm not speaking for him. I'm not using him as an example, but like one of the greatest things, Gervais said again, I feel like we're just talking about Gervais. He's a genius, but your identity 
of who exactly you are is not a football player. It's, it's way more, you know? And like, I, I learned that at a young age. And like, I guess I've been playing, not a young age, but playing football. I've been playing for 20 years. As anybody that doesn't really know me, they're like, Oh, that like football player, you know, that's my identity to them. But like my message to those kids coming up would be like, what do your three or four best friends say to you? Say about you? What do you, what are your, uh, uh, what do your brothers and sisters say about you? What do your close relatives say about you? Are, 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 you know, are you this star that's like just a star and a football player? You know, what more, what more can you or do you want to be? Because I think a lot of these kids want to be more, you know, which I did. You, you guys, open, you guys are the first ones to kind of open me up. So, yeah. like, that's what I'd say is like, they want to be more. Don't be afraid to kind of be, um, be unique in your own way and kind of, uh, you know, be creative um, and see opportunity, not fear. I think a lot of them are, you know, once they get tagged as that, it's like, this is who I am. Like, this is, this is it, you know? Um, and we all rode that train for a good bit. Um, and at some point, you know, something's going to get in the way. Um, and it's going to be for the better um, temporarily, hopefully, like you said. And then, you know, have a little bit of perspective. I mean, look, there's tons of guys that have been in your same spot. Go look at how they all play out, you know? It ain't yeah. like, like there ain't, there ain't a hundred Tom Brady's, you know, and there ain't 50 Pat Mahomes, you know? <laughs> um, I think, um, yeah, the, the perspective gets skewed a little bit, you know, early on, but like, I don't want to say that they're, they're doing anything wrong. I would just give them the advice of like, what do your best friends say about you? You know? Yeah. Um, how can you be more than just, just a ball player? Cause you are, you know? How did you define discernment again? I mean, discernment basically in a nutshell is knowing when to do when. Yeah, sorry, when to do what? Yeah, I, I, I that that word triggered to me as you uh, as you were speaking, knowing when to do what, right? And I think for young, high profile, high school athletes, I I also would advise just just to be and enjoy it as as it's rolling and take it as it comes. And, and that's all you have to be, you know, cause when you get to the next level, like there's another set of ceilings or floors within your career. And I think all too often we can forget the, the one that we're on. Uh, and I think you've always done a great job of that, man. You, you've done a, done a remarkable job in this conversation. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the next phase of your life. I think the listeners are going to wonder, um, what are you doing on NFL draft weekend? Where will you possibly be? And, and what is that going to be like for you and your family? Yeah, it's funny. Like, just before this call, I was talking to my pops about and my, and my mom and my sisters about what we wanted to do. Um, definitely going to be with the family. Probably going to be at the house, you know, hanging with the dogs. Um, you know, who knows where I'm going to go? I have no idea. I, I have zero expectations, which this time around, I, you know, I've, you know, I've been – in the top five talk two years ago. And, and now, you know, I'm where I'm at. And so I, I am um, thrilled for any opportunity. I believe I could be a value add and an asset. I'm healthier than I've ever been. And, and um, you know, I'm gonna spend that time with the family and just kind of enjoy the moment, you know, nothing crazy. Um, just going to hang out. Good. Well, we'll be hanging out watching as well. We won't blow you up uh, on the phone immediately. I'll give it a couple of days. I'm sure it will, uh, it will be busy, man. But for somebody who's known you for a long time, I know on behalf of the Elite 11, everybody at the Pac-12 Networks, Ted Robinson, my partner, um, who I know uh, you're a fan of, and, and he's a huge fan of you. Uh, we enjoy just staying in touch, man. Uh, it's, it's been a blast to, to not just have the phone call, you and I, but also kind of record it here and kick it out for other people to listen to. I, I think you are, A, an incredible role model for the position, for competitors, for high performers, um, and it's it's somebody I've I've really enjoyed being around in my career, man. So thanks for the time. Appreciate it, Yogi. Thanks a lot, man.